know, for having the opening comments, and then we'll get on with a couple questions, and then we'll open up to questions from the floor. First question, uh, you want an update on uh, what's going on at the State House and regarding the gas tax. Uh, the gas tax was a uh, was a tough decision for me. Going through the campaign, I had stated that uh, I would prefer not to do it, but if I got down there and uh, I felt like it was the, the best way to go, that I would support it, and I did. I did vote for the gas tax. Uh, a couple of the reasons that I did were, uh, number one, uh, I want to do as much as we can to keep it off the back of the property taxpayers, so the state, I, I think, had to, had to uh, kind of take the lead on it a little bit. Am I coming through okay back there? Everybody hear me? Okay, thank you. Uh, so I, that was one of the reasons. Uh, I saw that uh, states like Missouri and Illinois, uh, along with their gas tax, um, I think in both states there was around a billion dollars in state bonds they were taking out, and I really like to see Iowa remain a pay-as-you-go state, and so I, I favored it for that reason also. Uh, uh, I do not enjoy putting a tax on anybody, uh, including myself, and uh, I think what they said was that it was going to raise the taxes on a person who uh, drove approximately fifteen thousand dollars or fifteen thousand miles a year and had a vehicle that got 25 miles a gallon, that your, the, the tax on this would cost you about $60 a year or $5 a month. Uh, myself, with my businesses, I know that uh, my, my taxes are gonna go up about $50 a month based on uh, the vehicles that I drive, personal and, and for work. So I think we all had a little bit of skin in this game. Uh, I think a very important thing that we need to do as a legislature now is make sure the money get spent correctly and hold the DOT accountable and make sure that it goes to the right place. And, and that is something that I will be very, uh, work very hard to do. Uh, another thing that uh, I just want to bring up, uh, mental health, well, I think we're gonna to touch on mental health later, so maybe I'll just leave that. Do you have a mental health question there? Okay, I'll leave that for the, the mental health questions. Uh, so that obviously that's been taking up the oxygen at, uh, at the Capitol for the last two weeks at least, and it's been something that's been on the top of everybody's mind for a long time. And so, that being behind us, uh, I'd like to, to work on new things that we can do now uh, for the state and, and for the constituents. So, with that, I'll turn it over to, uh, to Mark. Thanks, Brian. Uh, I apologize, but I won't stand up. If you really want me to, I could, but I may fall down. <laughs> I've had ongoing, ongoing back problems for quite a while, Bear with me. Uh, what? Well, since we're talking about gas tax, let's start with that. Uh, uh, I want you to know that every forum I've been to in the last three years, that's been the dominant question that come up at every forum. And I think I've been consistent from where I stood on that at every forum since since we started having these. And that was that I was in favor of, of improving our roads and. Uh, so it was an easy decision for me, and I think you all realize that, that, that I was for this. And, and uh, because of the county supervisor, I, I've seen many times where our funding wasn't going to allow us to fix bridges and, and our roads that, that uh, are in desperate need. And I was, I, it was made uh, reinforced this morning on my way to Audubon as I'm going south of Arcadia on what we call the OCO, which you understand is the Omaha Cutoff, that's what OCO stands. It's probably one of the oldest highways uh, in between Carroll and, and Crawford County, actually. And uh, it's not in the best shape anymore. And uh, 
And why is that? I think you could take a brand new road, a country road here in Iowa, and, and if it was left unmaintained for 10 years with the frost and the heat that we have going on, you probably couldn't drive on it at the speed limit. Well, halfway to Manning on that road this morning, I get a whiff of, of uh, wood smoke, like somebody had their fireplace going. And as soon as I went over the hill, I figured out, I found out real quickly where the fire, there was a house on fire just, uh, uh, just over the hill with uh, several uh, fire trucks there on scene. And, and it, it didn't look really good to me. It looked pretty nasty. And, and so there's a lot of reasons to have good roads out in our rural areas. And that was proof of one of them right there. We need it for our own safety uh, as far as uh, protecting our property and, and firemen on their way out there because I also met fire trucks at a high rate of speed going to that fire. So, uh, you know, there's lots of reasons that you can use for having good roads in Iowa. And economic development is certainly one of them. And safety for us. Uh, one of the things, if you go to Des Moines every day, you'll see a sign over the interstate that tells you how many people have died on our roads in the last year. And at the end of last year, we were uh, about 325, I think. It's almost one person a day that dies on our roads. And why is that? Well, there's a lot of bad driving habits out there currently. And, uh, but there's also some bad roads out there that can cause accidents. So uh, uh, the vote was, of course, to increase the tax by 10 cents. And uh, for, for Carroll County, that would mean that uh, there would be an extra $735,860 for the county to use in their secondary road program. Now for Crawford, it's $788,178. For Sac County, it's $704,489. And for uh, Audubon, it was $515,243. Uh, I think, and Brian brought this up in Audubon, that actually uh, Audubon was a a net, they got more back than they were putting in. Unfortunately, the rest of us are putting in a little bit more than we're getting back. And so there was an argument that, uh, you know, maybe we should change the formula. Well, one of the things I've always said that I can't live with changing the formula, and uh, some of the debate in our caucus, at least, was that, that because of this discrepancy, are we really doing that much good for our rural roads? And uh, my comment would be the current the current formula is, allows 32 and a half cents to come back out of every dollar to, to the counties. Now, if you haven't noticed, our population base, uh, I have five counties in my district. The city of Des Moines has seven districts all by itself. So uh, we're always outvoted. If we get into a battle over formula changes, we're never going to win that battle. In fact, that's what happened with Time 21. We went back to 20% of that amount of money. So really, I think we're getting a pretty good deal at getting 32 and a half, or about a third of the money that's going to be generated by this tax. So, but is it is it a natural thing for me? I felt like the day after, and I felt ever since, kind of like I just bought a new farm for fifteen thousand dollars. It's great to have a new farm, but I don't know whether we'll ever get the fifteen thousand dollar part of it fixed. So, uh, it, it it's been a tough week, but uh, I'm glad it's it's over and we're moving forward. So. Uh, the other comment would be, and I'm probably taking too long, uh, next week is the first funnel week. What does that mean? That means that every bill that's out there to stay alive must get through a subcommittee and a full committee to remain eligible for debate on the floor. And so uh, ne after next week, uh, if you have a special bill that you're working on, if it doesn't get out of the committee that it was assigned to, whether it was in the House or the Senate, it, it could functionally be dead for the rest of the year. There's another funnel week about a month from now, or next week, that, that says the same thing, only it has to be bills that were uh, sent over from one house to the, to the other house to uh, stay alive. But, uh, unless it's an appropriations bill, and they're always alive. If that's something that comes out of ways, ways and means, they're always eligible for, for debate no matter when. So that's, that's the big news, I guess. Next question is, what are the main topics of conversation in the Health and Human Science Services Committee regarding mental health, and where does the status stand on funding for mental health? Thanks, Rob. Well, this week, I think you all realize that both Brian and I are on the Health and Human Service Budget Subcommittee and the Human Resources Committee, which 
actually deals with the budget for health and human service and, and public health and, and all kinds of, of things. It's a, the Medicaid budget is $4.2 billion. And uh, this year, uh, the, the impetus is to go to what's called managed care. Now, we've used managed care in the past in Iowa for mental health uh, uh, budgets. Uh, it, it's been through a thing called Magellan, is the company that runs it. That's a for-profit, and I talked about this at the last forum, it's a for-profit uh, group, and, and uh, but it manages the money that would go to nursing homes and, and uh, places like that. And uh, so this process this year is, to, is uh, a proposal to go to manage care across the board for everything that goes out of the mental health budget. And that's a $4.2 billion budget. The goal of managed care is to provide health care assistance to about 560,000 people in Iowa at a cost of approximately $4.2 billion. A key challenge is the increasing cost to provide services and decreasing federal funds to do so. Uh, the cost of delivering this program has grown by 73% since 2003, and the Medicaid total expenditures are projected to grow by 21% in the next three years. Uh, and I also visited the, uh, the Mental Health Institute. One of the proposals the governor had, of course, was to close two of our mental health institutes, one in Mount Pleasant and the other one in Clorinda. So I joined a group of senators yesterday to tour the Clorinda facility. We, we were there with uh, Senator Ho, Senator Gronstall, and Senator Mathias, they're all on the Human Resources Committee, by the way. And, and for, uh, it was myself and uh, Senator Shipley, who is the new senator from Western Iowa, and Senator Costello, who is the new senator from uh, Joni Ernst's district, that's, that's Corinda. Uh, so there was three R's and three D's in the group, and, and I think we all came back uh, from that visit realizing that the, even though the facility is, is over 100 years old, it's really an excellent facility. And uh, one of the things the governor's budget did was cut off funding to that already last fall. And so their patient numbers are down. Uh, they only have 17 in their, their geriatric, uh, uh, their psych, the geri psych, it's easy for you to say, geriatric psych ward. But they have room for 20, there's three, three different wards, 20, 20, and 20. They could have 60, 60 beds available there. Uh, and that's just for people that are mentally ill that are on Medicaid. That's, that's, they have to have those qualifications too. And they had to be refused from going anywhere else 15 times before they're eligible to go there. So the, the, the population has really shrunk at those facilities. But they're still fine facilities. And, and since there have been the governor and the budget is declaring that they're going to close in, in the 1st of July. They're also losing staff and to the tune that next week they were probably going to lose eight staff. Although the one nurse said that's one entire night shift off of the ward, uh, but there's only 17 people in the ward. So there's room there for, to fill up a lot of the gaps that our sheriffs are having, that finding a place to send committals. Unfortunately, their psychiatrist is 70 years old and about to retire, so that's that's another problem, but uh, I think they could get by that. So the rest of the short, long story short, if that's possible for me, is that uh, you know, I'm on the Appropriations Committee. We met as an Appropriations Committee last week to, a uh, bill was proposed that I was on the sub subcommittee and supported as well, to extend the, another six months at least to the end of the fiscal, this fiscal year, to keep the, the doors open at Clorinda. And I supported that out of the subcommittee, and it was, it was unanimously voted out of the Appropriations Committee, so it has bipartisan support to keep those doors open, because I don't believe the regions are ready to uh, fill up that gap yet. I, I think in the end, managed care is where we're gonna be, but we're just not ready there. We're not gonna be ready for that by the 1st of July, and it'd be a shame to, uh, allow that place to close and, and not have a facility at all to support these people with mental illness. So uh, that's, that's my answer for the human services problem. And uh, what's the next question? Status? Maybe I'll just let Brian talk about it. Yeah, he's status. <coughs> Thank you.
I think the governor's push towards uh, moving the mental health out of the two state institutions is, uh, I understand where he's coming from because I, I believe that there is a cost that is just absolutely uh, super expensive. They, they say it takes between four hundred and five hundred thousand dollars a year to house somebody at Mount Pleasant or at uh, Clorinda. And so I think that's his reason. He wants to he wants to find efficiencies, and I understand that. Uh, sitting on the on the appropriations along with uh, with Mark here, uh, I agree that uh, it was a very very uh, it, it was a speedy decision. We're doing things really fast. I, I'm, I I think what we need to do is just kind of get our arms around it. When you sit on an appropriations committee like this, and all of a sudden we're talking about managed care when we've been in a uh, fee-for-service type of, of environment for so long. Uh, I think we're all, we're, we're all trying to understand the concept. And, uh, and so to do it all this quickly is definitely a challenge. Uh, I think it's gonna, the, the, the managed care component and the issue is gonna have uh, possible effects on, on places like New Hope Village, on our hospitals, on everybody. So uh, we have a really fast learning curve. We gotta learn a lot of things really fast on how this is gonna help or how the managed care is going to save us this money. We, we've been told that managed care should save $50 million, uh, should save the state $50 million. And uh, uh, I'm trying to figure out how we're going to save the $50 million. And uh, secondly, uh, when managed care comes in, I think it's going to be very, very important for the legislature to make sure that they're doing what they're supposed to do and not cutting off uh, services and making services hard to acquire for folks that need them because managed care as a gatekeeper needs to make sure they do the job that they're supposed to do and, and make these services available for people that need them. So that's going to be uh, that's going to be a challenge and something that I'm really interested in is to see, okay, with managed care, uh, if, they, if they cut back on duplication of services, that's great. They, they, can, they do serve a function for that. But they, those functions and those services still have to be available to uh, to the constituents and, and to the people that need them. Uh, something else that's, that's going on right now, and uh, uh, I was on the committee and we voted this in, is uh, bed tracking system for uh, places like uh, what would be uh, the Independence and uh, uh, the facilities we have now, and. What happens in the past, as I understand it, is it's possible that you may, as a sheriff, uh, have decided that you had a bed up in, uh, in Cherokee, and you took your, your person there, by the time you got there, an emergency had taken place, and you were sent back with uh, the person you took up there with. And absolutely, that's a bad thing, obviously, because uh, of the shortage. So the bed tracking system, what that does is it's gonna be a way for uh, local entities to get on the system and find out if there is a bed available and once you reserve that bed it's guaranteed to you and so that's a good thing I think that would that would mean if you drove from Carroll to Cherokee uh, with somebody who needed that mental health that that bed would be locked up and it would be reserved for you so you wouldn't get up there and, and be sent back so that's a good thing and uh, that's a bill that I will support it we did pass the committee this week Next, excuse me, our next question is the property tax relief program. What type of impact has Iowa seen in economic development? And the second part of that is with backfilling fiscal obligations with state aid, what is the sustainability of that program? Uh, I checked into the uh, to see if there was any statistics uh, on, on what it's doing for Iowa since the property tax reduction went into effect. And, and really they haven't they haven't been able to pull statistics together on that, but I then went to the uh, Iowa Association of Business and Industry and found out that Iowa is now ranked second for for being a, a great place to start a new business. So that's that was quite a jump from I think we were seventh before that, and maybe even worse. So we're are, we're much more attractive now in, a, in, in a enticing new business to come to Iowa. So that's. That's a pretty good sign because uh, new business, of course, is the recipient of that property tax relief. Uh, I've got some numbers here that uh, I, uh, in Storm Lake last week, we, we were talking with the city manager there, 
And for the city of Storm Lake, it was going to amount to $63,000 of, of Iowa property tax relief funds uh, to backfill the city of Storm Lake. And uh, I looked those up. They, they can be found on the Department of Management's website. For, uh, and it even has schools and and cities, and if I find them here, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the, the numbers. I got plenty of material along this morning in case you, you want to go on a leave early. <laughs> you want to comment while I'm looking? Uh, regarding the backfill obligations, the, the, I did some research. And the way I understand it is, is that uh, the backfill will be guaranteed through the year 2017, and at that point it will cap out, so it can never go any higher than where it was at that point. And uh, uh, as far as the sustainability of the program, uh, I guess the the obligation the state is making, as I said before, is that they do have to backfill into, until 2017. That's, that's about all I have to say about that topic. $96,077. So uh, that would have all been tax money that would have come from property tax before this bill was passed. From commercial property tax, not, not just regular property tax. So this is the money that's coming from the taxpayer trust fund then at the state level and probably our reserve that we, we still have uh, in our state budget uh, for the next three years. and. Uh, so it's a significant amount, and that's why we probably jumped to second as far as being friendly for new business. And, and, and is it s s sustainable? <laughs> Say that fast three times. Uh, it is at this point, but we're going to have to be very careful on how we spend our surplus funds because uh, the proposed budget by the governor actually is a deficit spending budget. So uh, it's going to be hard to... Uh, Keep that, but I know the governor is intending to keep his promise on those. So, uh, are those this year's numbers? Or they're the latest numbers. Yeah, yeah, they were for for the year for for last year for 2014. The way it looks, because I know that number for the next fiscal year for the school district is 270 thousand dollars. Okay, and that's this is probably a year old, right? which is a little scary. That's a big number. I'm sure. Well, it, it is if the, it is if the money doesn't. Yeah, yeah, I hear your pain. We uh, will open up for questions from the floor. Carol? Carol Claus, and Carol City Manager, Senator Brickmark, and Representative Des, thank you very much for voting for the gas tax. If I've done my calculations correctly, it's been 27 years, 1988, it was last passed and came into effect in 1989. That's about four tenths of a cent per year. Last night I was in Omaha and I noted Thanks, Gerald. Uh, it has been an issue for a long time in, in Iowa, and, it's, it's, and people are saying that it's happened so quickly. Well, it really hasn't happened that quickly. It's, it's taken a long time, and it's been an issue for a long time. It's been <laughs> the number one question at every forum I've been to in three years. So, and it's uh, you know, I, I, was I happy? Exactly happy with the bill? No, but that was the one that was before us, and the only one that had a chance. 
I'd have rather it would have been in effect in two, two or three set increments than it did one of We actually offered it in, in the Senate a couple of amendments that would have adjusted it, but they were both ruled non germane that would have had a, a tax credit back for, for people to, so Iowans would pay uh, as much as, as the out of state people. But uh, we will be bringing funds and out from out of state travelers as they come across. So. Questions from the floor? We've asked that you uh, stand up and introduce yourself, uh, and if you are representing an organization, and then uh, ask a question. My name is Pat Hanna, and I'm a member of the Board of Directors here at New Hope. And my question concerns the managed care system. Um, Brian, I thank you for addressing that this morning, and especially for your concern about oversight and making sure that people continue to receive the services that are necessary. Because um, part of my question has to do with accountability. First of all, who would that those managed care companies be accountable to. Um, and then the second part of my question um, has, has to do with whether you have received any research about the implementation of managed care in other states, how that has worked out for individ particularly for individuals with disabilities. I know the Medicaid budget is a lot bigger than that, covers a lot more people. But I, I'm wondering if you've got any research about how that's worked out in other states and if, if you haven't, will you require some of that research before this is implemented here in Iowa? Thank you. Yeah, thanks for your question. Uh, the, the, the groups that are presenting the managed care, am I still on? Testing one, two. Maybe you have to sit down, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll take the chance to try to stand. See what we're doing here. Uh, there is going to be accountability, and I think that is being looked at right now. And in the last committee meeting we had, I think they're still trying to sort out where that accountability will come from. If it'll be within the legislature, or if it'll be uh, something that'll be handled within the uh, Department of Human Services. Do you recall, Mark, where that went? Or, or were you at that uh, subcommittee meeting when we talked about that? The Senate doesn't always come to ours. Okay, okay. I, I know Representative Heaton, uh, who's the chair of our committee, is, is very concerned with that. And there is going to be, I believe, a five or seven uh, person panel who they will have to, I believe on a monthly basis, the managed care organization will have to be uh, vetted on what's going on, uh, doing some standards to make sure the quality of care is still there. Okay. Yeah. I'm sorry, Brian, I wasn't really listening to your question, so I didn't know what it was. But uh, we did have uh, input last week from a gentleman from Illinois who had consulted on how they set up their managed care. Now, it's a little scary thinking about you getting consultants from Illinois. <laughs> I apologize for that. But the thing he stressed the most was this, this oversight committee that needs to be created to, to stay over the top of the managed care that you hire and he spent a lot of time talking about that so that's a big piece of this this new puzzle now here, here's the dates that Chuck Palmer just gave us last week the request for the proposal which is the the contract that they're going to have to fulfill this 4.2 do million dollar contract uh, uh, went out last week and here's the deadlines and they're going to take they're going to have 17 meetings around the state and, and you'll have to I'll try to update you on that as we go along. But they're gonna you know, bring this request, they're gonna talk about it locally. At, uh, and he said if you can get 250 people, he'd come to, to, to wherever you could guarantee 250 people. So uh, there, after these 17 meetings, there's gonna be a time period where providers can make comments, and then they're gonna take those comments and go back and adjust the RFP uh, to, to Need some, so there'll be an opportunity for you to make comment, comment on, on what's going on out there, which is really good, I yes. think, for yes. you. Yes. And uh, so the deadline for that, the RF, uh, 
The amendment is March 26, and the comment period will end March 20th. And then the awards are going to be uh, uh, to the contractors, which will probably be three new contractors. Right now, it's Magellan and the Iowa Medicaid Enterprise are, are two of the contractors that we currently already use. We, we use managed care a lot in Iowa already, but there will be three new ones, the way I understand it. And uh, they're going to award those uh, July 31st of 2005 with the, the effect being that they'll start on January 1st of 2016. That. So, uh, but I'll try to keep you informed, and I'm sure that there'll be a, a news article that'll come out that will give you dates and times and places for these uh, provider meetings with okay. with Chuck Palmer. So, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Go ahead. Mark Grantham, my wife Charlene. Um, we have a son also, Andy, who lives here um, in Carroll. Um, he serves on Uvo Village, and I wanted to echo what uh, Pat said too about accountability. I mean, that's huge. You know. Cuts and things, somebody needs to answer to those, and, and I just do not think that we can survive any of those cuts because, on the federal level, um, we're we're lobbying the DHS as a parent right now because they're making changes on the federal level that's going to affect New Hope Village's services. They want to get the get their clients out in the community more and get them more involved, and and that's all a good thing. But staffing is a huge issue. I also was on the board here for six years with New Hope Village and. The staffing, um, it's, it's almost impossible to get people, enough people to work to provide the services that's required by the DHS and it's, it's getting worse or, or they're requiring more, I guess, whether it's worse or not, that's an issue, but it's, it's an issue for New Hope to be able to provide the staffing required and that costs more money. If we need more people, it's going to cost more money. Then if the state is looking at saving $51 million or whatever it is, how that's going to occur without affecting services, I mean, that's just a huge concern for us as parents. So anything you could do to reflect, but investigate that, we'd appreciate it. Well, thank you, Mark. Uh, just uh, uh, the, in the closing of the Florinda and Mount Pleasant, the governor was suggesting in six months they were going to save 50, no, no, 51 was the total. It was $17 million. That, that's what the, it was going to take to keep those two facilities open. And uh, so it, you're probably looking at two guys that may end up on that, that oversight board. <laughs> and and I, I'm serious about that. <laughs> I think that's very, very possible. So. I think the 1.25 uh, is a starting point, and I do believe when the Senate comes back and, and when when the two the two houses get together, uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see it rise a little bit. Uh, as your representative, the tough thing for me to do is to weigh uh, our 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 state's ability to fund different things and being on on health and human services, you know. We've got a lot of issues in the state, and we, we try to do the best job we, we can to address them. I would like to see, personally, I'd like to see more money go to education, but at the same time, I have to, uh, I have to be diligent with the tax money. I do, I do believe that the fact that the, the first, uh, 
the first amount of money, the $200 million that we had to spend, the first $100 million did go to education. And within that scope, all I can say is I will do anything I can to make sure that we free up money. Because I know there's a lot of money that gets categorized and can't be used efficiently for the schools. So I'll do whatever I can in that area, too, to make sure that uh, common sense can be used by the administration and by the school boards to use that money. But uh, I think when the, the two sides get together, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if it comes up a little bit. I don't know what it's going to be. I can't say. Uh, I, I think uh, one, one comment that has been made by uh, Speaker Paulson is that uh, that would be on the table. Uh, uh, raising the amount would be on the table if uh, they would consider collective bargaining reform. Uh, that's just a comment that he's made. So I, I don't have uh, anything to say about that comment. I'm just saying that that's what he said, and that might, that might uh, be a way of negotiating a little bit on, on that amount that we end up with the, uh, uh, the allowable growth. Just a little bit about the process. Of course, the House came out with their proposal first. It did not match. What the, what the Senate's proposal, the one that was passed a couple of weeks later. So when it got sent back to the House, they like to say they have to fix what, what the Senate messed up. Since we didn't pick up their bill, uh, they didn't match, so they couldn't go to a conference committee. So last week, uh, the House sent it back with a, with a message to insist on their version, which of course didn't pass in the, in the, in the Senate. And, I voted with the House to insist for it, by the way, just to keep the process moving. But when it functionally did get the process made, so now it's in a conference committee, and they can talk about it. And, and uh, the, ho the House is at 1.25, the Senate was at 4%. So it's going to be a number somewhere in, inside those 4, 2, and 1, and 2, 5. So that's where we're at currently. And uh, I guess I have a question for you. In the areas that Iowa has dropped, <laughs> what areas are we really falling short in? I mean, we can fix the problem if we know what the problem is. Uh, what areas uh, do you know? I, I don't want to put you on the spot here. Supplemental state aid is the number one resource of our revenue. That's what we hire them to teach. So do you have to buy better teachers? Do you think the Try to maintain the ones you have. Okay, but, but Again, it's back to the scores. You know, I, it, it seems to get hung up a lot. People say, well, we keep spending more and more money, but we, our results aren't getting, we're not keeping the same place we were. Do you, you understand my question? I want to know uh, what areas, are, is the core, the core the problem, the core subject? Are we teaching to the test? Is that the problem, that we don't get better outcomes? Well, our class numbers are getting higher and higher all the time. That's a good thing. Your classroom numbers of kids or classroom numbers of scores? Students in the classroom. Okay. Have you put Carol, your school, specifically into the, to see where Carol rates in that group? Uh, you know? If you could find that out for me, that would be helpful for me. Uh, I intend on supporting what the, the revenue conference, the, the conference committee comes back with, of course, but. Uh, there's no, there's no changing that once it comes, when it goes to a conference committee, whatever they report back is, is the only thing you can vote on. You can't, you can't change it by amendment at that point. So, all right, thank you. Other questions? Mm -hmm.
had that same question about <laughs> the uh, gambling money that uh, was supposed to go to. I don't, I don't remember. That was before my time when the gambling money was intended. But it does go to the RIP fund, the renew, renewing Iowa infrastructure. And uh, uh, the oversight there is through the commission, the department, the DOT commission. There's three commissioners, which we have none from Western Iowa at in. They, they perform the oversight function of, of where the money goes there. And uh, let's see, there was another point I was going to make. Oh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Ames lights. Does anybody know what I'm talking about when I talk about the Ames lights? <laughs> Aren't they pretty? But that wasn't your road use tax funds that, that put those up. That was federal road use tax funds, which come encumbered, which means they have to be spent for artsy, excuse me, artsy fartsy things. <laughs> and, and that's what put the Ames, if you go east on Highway 30 through Ames, there, there'll be about six towers on each side of the road, and at night they turn colors. They're pink and blue, and they're kind of pretty, but you know, that makes people upset. Well, well, we can't fix our road out in the country, and you're driving by, and there's a big argument over two, two Taj Mahals, they call them, which are road stops by Ankeny that are, are, aren't open yet, but they're, they're close. And, and they, were wrote, they were required by this encumbered money from the feds. So I'm going to draft a letter, and I was hoping to do it by today, but I didn't get it done, and send to our, our, rep our congressman and ask them to unencumber those funds. Because if they'd have done that, we could have maybe avoided this whole gas tax issue in the first place. So. Don, I'll answer your question about uh, the Second Amendment. Uh, I know Matt Winchell is working on something right now in the House, and I haven't read it, but uh, I think there's something that's going to be coming out, I believe, this session uh, regarding Second Amendment rights. Keep us posted. Pardon? Keep us posted. Okay, I will. I'll keep you posted. Absolutely. Do you want to write a letter to Michael Groundstaller? Because it will be dead in the Senate. It won't. It won't. I don't even know if we get assigned to a committee. So you you need to talk to the, the chairman. Does anybody know what committee that would be in? Do you know? Is it in judicial? Is that where the where it would be? Okay. Send your email to the chairman of that committee. And that's a good place to start requesting them to respectfully put it in committee so it would move. But the problem is it has to move by next Friday because that's the first funnel. If it doesn't, it's dead for this year. So. Okay. We needed a whisper in Brownstall here on the way down to inspect the mail in institution. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
um, steam and being talked about right now. So hopefully you're both aware of this issue. Do you know the bill numbers? Yeah. I have the bill numbers, yes. Um, the, the justice bill is SSB 1202. And then the, the one to raise the the money back to the locals is SSB 1131 and HF 199. So we support both of those, HF 199, to give more money back to the locals, but we do not support the state, this justice bill, because I mean, the whole point was to give us more money, and now the state wants to take it. Okay. If I might just real quick add, uh, Sarah got most of it, but the, the transition to a 700 megahertz system, we just got done with narrow banding. It's cost prohibitive to get everything to go. I don't know what the governor's thinking is on this, um, and, and it might have merit, but I, I haven't been able to uncover anything yet. But we just got, just got done spending several hundred thousand dollars narrow banding, and to, to move to 700, that would all be flushed down the toilet. And that's part of the SSB 1202? Yep. Yes. Okay. The, to narrow band, we had to buy all new pagers for every single fire department, ambulance. We had to switch out every radio and every police car, ambulance, fire truck, pager, HD 1250 radio. The pager is about $500 a piece. To go to the new system, it'd be about $5,000 a piece. None of our current stuff would work. Yeah, this is crazy. That, yes. that, 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 fire, is that fire call I have this morning right now, you can talk to the police chief, you can talk to the, the fire chief, because they're all on the same radio. And we thought we, that was the answer. It is the answer. And, but now FEMA says, no, we're FEMA, and uh, we need our own radio. So why we need to change this all again, I can't understand at all. Well, it's just a waste there's of a money. surplus this year, and we uh, received a $100,000 grant from the surplus. Um, part of the problem was only 46 counties applied for the money, so the governor said, well, how come the other 54 counties or 53 counties didn't apply? It's because it was only a $100,000 grant. So if you have a $400,000 project to give your um, 911 station, the next generation 911, yes, you get 100000 but the locals couldn't come up with the additional 300000 because the state isn't giving us all of our money back, so. Thank you. This happens in government all the time. It's a nightmare. Other questions? Uh, my name's John Cook. I, I live in Carroll, or just south of town. Um, and I want to thank you both for coming. And this is, this is mainly directed at uh, Representative Best, because uh, this week the, uh, the Senate passed uh, Senate File 270, which is a, a bill to, to uh, make sure that Iowa workers get paid for their work. Uh, there's about $600 million in wages that are stolen from workers every year, and, and our current laws are so weak that pretty much, it's pretty much unenforceable. So this would get some tougher laws that would make it, that pre would prevent wage theft. And is that something that if it comes to a vote in the House that you would support? That's my question. John, I'd have to respectfully tell you, at this point, I don't know enough about that issue to comment. And when you say $600 million has been stolen, I, I'm not sure what you mean by that. Can you tell me or expand on it a little bit? Well, that's, uh, sometimes people, and there are various ways this happens, people who are working then sometimes don't get paid for their work. Either they're forced to work extra hours and they just don't get paid for it, and there's a whole bunch of ways, or they or the uh, employer steals their tips, and there's a bunch of things that happen. Most employers, of course, don't do this, but, but there's enough that this happens, and especially since things seems to happen to low-income folks, and, and it's, uh, it shouldn't happen. And it should be prevented. Did you say there's a Senate bill? Yes, uh, SF-270. Uh, seen it with managed care 
I, I agree with you 100 percent absolutely Thanks, Lyle. Uh, I guess, you know, when you come to a forum, you're all subject to to being asked a question. It's not like it comes from here. So I'd like to know, Rob, what, what your thoughts are on, on getting uh, in the middle of a bullying incident off school. Well, I think it's an awful slippery slope. Um, you're asking the school administrators uh, primarily to get involved in something that uh, they don't have time to get involved in. Now, it happens in the building, I, you know, I get it. Um, but there's a lot uh, that, that does happen uh, online. Uh, you know, it's the era we live in. Um, now, if it carries over into the school and causes problems uh, in the school environment, obviously they should and need to get involved. Uh, but there's also things that happen outside of school settled outside of school by their parents. Um, you know, as a, as a, one of the writers from the newspaper called me the other day and I said, you know, it's not like kids are learning bullying in school. We don't have a special class on how to bully. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, and, and you know, so uh, we do teach anti-bullying, but we don't teach bullying. And so, uh, uh, you know, nobody, uh, nobody uh, supports bullying of any kind. Uh, it happens, it's happened as long as people but, but some of that that takes place outside of school, uh, the parents shouldn't be calling the school administrator and say, hey, take care of this for me. You know, when, when Johnny comes to school today, you know, whap him upside the head. You know, why doesn't Johnny's mom and dad get together with other Johnny's mom and dad and get it settled? You know, that's, it doesn't, it's not rocket science. Do you have a written policy that addresses this? Every school in Iowa does. Okay, I, I thought you probably did. So, for the state to come and tell you how to do things again is probably maybe overstepping. Although I think there was some money for teaching teachers, and as I said two weeks ago, I don't think you were present. That uh, you know any help teachers can give in this day and age on how to handle these kind of situations and, and what is politically correct. Uh, who knows? It, it's probably a good thing. It's, a, it's another in-service. Do you get in-services on these Plenty. things from AA? Plenty. Okay. All right. Do you have a comment, Brian? No? Okay. I another just, question. Oh, go ahead. Just a follow-up question that, you know, and he's talking about getting involved off campus and things. As a school bus driver, <laughs> do you get, if, you, if somebody <coughs> goes through your stop arm, you can turn them in. I hope you all realize that. At one point, when I was driving a school bus in, in Westside, I pulled over and, and, I got, and, I had, and I was at a railroad crossing and uh, I had the door open, which every right time you open the door, now a kid can jump out. <laughs> you gotta be careful. Uh, uh, 
a gravel truck roared by me on the left hand side at this at this grade crossing for the railroad so guess what senator say we're going to the pencil took his license plate and turned him in and so now guess what happens now I've got to go to court <laughs> it's not just turn him in now it's it's the impetus is on me and uh, I came to Carroll because that's where it was filed and uh, I sat there for about an hour that morning and staring at the guy I turned in by the way <laughs> and out of the uh, office comes a, a secretary saying well uh, the county now don't take this wrong the county attorney has looked at the case and says we probably can't do anything for you here today but thanks for turning it in so I went home and, and I can see the very same thing happen in a bullying case once you start this uh, you know, you're, you're getting all kinds of people uh, tied up in, in all kinds of ways. So, that's my comment. Any questions? One more? Yeah. My name is Tom Smith, and I'm representing myself. Uh, I, I bring this up because nobody else seems to want to. Uh, in this state, people like the owners of the Gort's House in Des Moines, uh, bakers, florists, are being punished for not wanting to participate in certain weddings that their faith, Christianity, specifically says are not marriages. Matthew 19, 4, Jesus said, marriage, one man, one woman. That's not up for debate. Um, no one has ever gone to jail for trying to get a marriage license. However, these people get their, everything they work for threatened to be taken away because they said they didn't interrupt a wedding, they just politely declined to participate in one. Uh, what is being done to protect Christians' rights to stand up for their own I'm familiar with the case. I believe that I'm familiar with the case. I believe that uh, happened to a person in the Des Moines area that uh, has gotten a lot of traction. Well, there's more than one case. Yeah, but there's one that I think a lot of people are talking about, and uh, I believe there is. Uh, I'm pretty sure there's a bill that they're working on right now that would give uh, give folks like that the option because it, it, it comes kind of their right as a First Amendment right or whatever you want to call it to say, no, I don't want to participate in this, and as a businessman, uh, I do believe they should have that right to say, I don't want to be involved in this. It's not, uh, I don't think that's being unfair to the person who is being affected by it, because they can go down the road and they can find that same service somewhere else. Absolutely. Yes, yeah. So I, I'm not 100% sure, but I think that there, there, somebody's working on a bill or they've been asked, they've asked one of the representatives to work on a bill that would address that. Absolutely. Yes, I would support it. And I'll, I'll add this a little. In the Senate last week, uh, Dennis Guth introduced a bill that would uh, acknowledge personhood. Uh, it's, a, it's a resolution, so it's not it's not a full bill. And, and uh, I got up and spoke on the on the fact that that uh, women who suffer through a miscarriage often. The example I gave was a woman who had had a miscarriage and then three weeks later got the bill from the hospital claiming it was an abortion. And it sent her through the roof, as you might imagine. But this, this bill would, uh, would uh, or this resolution would require a constitutional amendment for Iowa. It had to be passed next year, too, where we'd be able to vote on whether uh, a fetus is, is a person or not. And right. Well, I, would, I just want to say, if you legislators don't start standing up to these judges, They don't get to define what the Constitution says. The Constitution defines what it says. Everybody can read it. That's why everybody from you guys to soldiers dedicate their oath to the Constitution first, before the president, before anybody else. Thank you. Thank you. It, is, uh, it is 11 o'clock. If you have other questions or comments you, you want to meet with the legislature. Rob, I'm sorry. You, I'm sorry. you can Iowa, with them after. It is 11 o'clock. Iowa Code states one man, one woman. That's Iowa Code. There is no homosexual um, marriage in this Well, thank you for coming. Sure. I forgot to mention this earlier. Uh, uh, I had introduced a bill regarding the uh, private schooling. I think, I don't know if you're all aware of it, but I got the bill here 
which basically for private schools, it just gives them a little extra uh, help with tuition. So that bill is here. Uh, that bill is uh, passed subcommittee and is now going to committee. So I think I've been kind of talking about that. I just wanted to fill you in and let you know where it's at. And the bill is here if anybody wants to come up and get one. I got plenty of copies.